Can you hear me now? All right. Didn't have my mic on. I'm always self-conscious about leaving the mic on. I trust that Mike and Brandon will turn me off when I go sit down, but then when somebody walks up to me to talk to me, I'm like... So I turn it off and get turn it back on. Hey, man, it's good to be back in God's house this morning. Amen? Amen. I, um, I want to ask you to do something for me. Um, not just for me, but for the church, for... Um, that person who may be lost and, and trying to make a decision for Christ. Welcome home, Frankie. Good to have you home, brother. Sorry, squirrel, but good to see you this morning. He came up and prayed, and I was like, hey, Frankie's back. So I, 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 I know that there's a potential that what I'm getting ready to say may be received the wrong way. Please don't don't receive it the wrong way because I don't mean it that way. It's just hear pastor's heart. We've been going through the training for the past three weeks on Wednesday night for the altar training. How many of you remember the morning, the night, the day that you decided, maybe you were in church, that you decided to step out and come to an altar and, and give Christ your heart and ask Christ into your heart? It is a very powerful moment. It's a very pivotal moment. So I, I want to be, um, I want to be, I want to see both sides of it, so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm going to ask you, many of the folks that come to the second service, or several folks that come to the second service, uh, have a meeting to get to at, is it 12.15? It's at 12. Okay. So here's what I would like to ask you to do. And if anybody here is offended by this, please come see me. I want to talk to you, because I don't want you to leave here offended today. Everybody say, love the pastor. Some of them are like, well, let's wait to hear what you got to say first, and I'll tell you if I love you. <laughs> what I would like to ask you to do is if, if you have to get to that meeting, I thought it was at 1215, but they're saying 12. Sit somewhere strategic in this house so that when you get up to leave, you're not potentially drawing someone's attention from the most important decision they may ever make. Can we do that? Keeping it real. Is anybody in here offended by that? Okay, perfect. I don't, I don't want to hurt anybody or, or, or hurt anybody's feelings, but there are times, see, y'all don't have the perspective that I have up here. There are times that we will be in a pivotal moment, and, and, and I understand, I, I, I honor you, and I value your decision to prioritize to be in that meeting. Do you hear me? But, but sometimes when that happens, I can see a person with tears streaming down their face, and this is what they do. They can't help it. They're just distracted. And many times that person will instantly, their whole face will change, and they'll go right back to just sitting there, and they're not tuned in. I just don't want to. I want to do everything I can do in here to create an environment conducive for life change. Amen? Amen. All right. Now I'm going to preach. So I've looked over the past few weeks. Usually when I come in on Mondays, um, Missy will ask me you know, for graphics and things like that. She'll say, what are you preaching next Sunday? And usually on Monday I can give the, the sermon name or, or the topic or whatever. But this past week she, she came in and she says, so what are you preaching on Sunday? And I said, I don't know yet. And uh, she said, what are you preaching on? Um, Thank you, brothers. Appreciate that said, uh, what are you preaching on? She came in and she used the same thing. What are you preaching on? And I said, I don't know. And she was kind of like, okay. And then uh, Wednesday, same thing. And by Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning, I could start to see a little bit of panic on her face. Like, okay, I'm running out of time and I got to get this up together. So I, I came in. I've been looking over the past few weeks. Um, had a little bit of time. And I've always got, I don't even know how many sermons that I've, I've written and God's just never released me to preach them before. But I was looking over the sermons over the past few weeks. It's been a little rough around here. Amen? I, I'm sorry. Not really, but I'm being nice. I'm sorry that it's been kind of rough around here the past few weeks. Uh, I, sometimes I get, you know, I, I, I mean, I preach what God tells me to preach, and then I go back and look at it later, and I'll read through my sermons and go, that was kind of hard. That was kind of hard. But I hadn't run you off yet. You're back. Tim, you came back, so it must not be too bad. So I've been asking the Lord this week while Missy was coming every morning and, and 
worrying me to death about what I'm going to preach on. I just started asking God, you know, what, 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 do, I, what do I need to do? What do I need to preach on? I just, you, normally I don't draw up blanks like that. And I just have been thinking about home a lot. And I, I thought home as in where I come from, West Tennessee, but I realized about midweek this past week that what the Holy Spirit was trying to tell me was tell them about home. So I want to just talk to you about heaven today. Can I do that? This is going to be the easiest sermon that you'll have to listen to probably for a while. And before you get your hopes up, this week I'm going to talk to you about heaven. Next week, we'll talk about hell. <laughs> so, give me all your love today, because next week it may not be that great, okay? I can tell you. One, um, one moonlit night, it's a grandpa, but I'm a papa, so I'm going to say papa. Papa was walking around out in the yard with his little granddaughter. and <clears throat> Try not to cry again. I miss my baby holding her hand, and they're looking up at the night sky. They're watching the stars twinkle and every once in a while a shooting star. And Papa is pointing out the constellations and just trying to, just to, to, to teach his granddaughter just the glory of the sky and, and, and how God created the planets and the stars. And when he was well into his rant, the little girl stopped dead in her tracks and squeezed his hand and looked up, and she said, Papa. If the bottom side of heaven looks like that. Imagine what the top side looks like. You're going to see a lot of this today. But I can't talk about heaven without getting emotional. John 14, 1 through 3. Jesus is talking here. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, here it is, are many mansions. I like how he clarifies. If it weren't so, or if this wasn't the truth, I wouldn't be telling you. So the next time somebody says, well, Jesus is being metaphorical, Tell them to walk into this. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go, listen to this, I go, the maker of the universe. I go to prepare a place for you. It took him seven days, six days, to create everything you've ever seen in your life. But he's saying, but I'm going, and from now until you get there, I'm going to meticulously, Peggy, I'm going to prepare every part of your heaven for you, your mansion for you. It's going to be perfect for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. We are very shy or timid these days of even mentioning heaven. Um, when I was a kid growing up, a lot of the, the songs that we sang in the old red and greenback hymnals, some of y'all don't even know what those are, talked about heaven. Um, one of my favorite, probably my all-time favorite gospel hymn, you've heard me try to sing it before, but one glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air, coming after you and me. Oh, what joys to spare. I mean, I just, it just creates, those old songs just create an image for you. It's going to be a wonderful day. But we, for some reason, we're, I don't know if we're just woke or we're trying to keep it real. We don't want to talk about heaven anymore. We don't want to be accused of having some pie-in-the-sky mentality and you know, oh, you need to keep your feet on the ground. And well, you, we weren't created to keep our feet on the ground. We weren't, we weren't created for this world. I shared in the first service why I love the name for your group. That's the, the, el, the seniors group is called Sojourners. That word literally means this ain't my home. I'm just passing through. 
C.S. Lewis, Lewis wrote once, we are afraid of being accused of having some pie-in-the-sky positivity and of being told that we are trying to escape from the duty of this world. He goes on to say, but either there is a pie in the sky or there is not. If there is not, then Christianity is false. For this doctrine is woven into its whole fabric. But if there is a pie in the sky, then this truth, like any other, must be faced, whether or not it's useful in political meetings. There is a heaven. It is a real place. It's prepared for you. It's being prepared for you. The first observation I want to make about the scripture that I just read is that God is preparing a place. Heaven is not a state of mind. It is a real location. I don't know the physical address, but it has one. It's a real place. What really jumps off that page for me, as I just mentioned, is right out of the gate, I think... Here's somebody who could snap his fingers and have your mansion prepared, but he doesn't do that. He wants it to be perfect. He's meticulously preparing it for us. He's taking his time with my heavenly home. He wants it to be just right. To be clear, you will learn more about heaven in your first five minutes there than I can teach you in the next 45 minutes here. But I want to accomplish two things today. I want to encourage you regarding your inheritance. Many of you here today already know that you have an inheritance. And I thank God for that. Many of you may not know. You're unsure. You're uncertain. You haven't made that decision. You've not accepted Christ into your heart. So one side of the church, one side of the coin today, I want to encourage you regarding your inheritance. The other side of that coin, I want to explain to you what your inheritance could be. Hebrews 2, 5, those of you that are taking notes, a ton of scripture today. Because I can't, I've never been to heaven. All I have is the word. Amen? Hebrews 2, 5 calls it the world to come. Hebrews 11.10 called it the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. In fact, if you go and you read, uh, I think it's in Revelation, I think it's in Revelation, there, the foundations or the pillars that hold up heaven all have names inscribed on them, one for every disciple. One of those pillars looks like graffiti, because it had a name, and that name got scratched out, and a new name, Matthias, got put in his place. But every pillar, I'm being humorous, don't, don't walk out on me. Every pillar has a name. It's, de it's described in multiple places what the foundations of heaven looks like. It says the city which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11:16. but now they desire a better that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them or for you. Revelation 21, 2 through 3 says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. You won't have to imagine anymore who he is and what he looks like and what he smells like and what his voice sounds like. We are to told more in Scripture about what heaven will not be like or what will not be in heaven than we are told what will be there and what it will be like. But I have determined that what it will not be like sounds good to me. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you today is not what heaven will be like. It will, what it, it will be what it's not going to be like. That's a tongue... That's a tongue. Say that three times fast. 
I heard a farmer one time, or read where a farmer one time asked his preacher, he said, can I chew my tobacco in heaven? The preacher surprised him. He said, absolutely, but you'll have to go to hell to spit. <laughs> many have stated, and I've heard this, many have stated that I just can't imagine worshiping every day for eternity. That just sounds like it's going to get old or get boring. I, I want to tell you, this is totally my idea. This is not scriptural. I'm just going to tell you how the pastor thinks about this. If, if being in this church during worship makes you uncomfortable, if you struggle with worshiping, I just believe you're going to be leading the choir in heaven. You, and I'm going to talk about this more in a minute, but you are going to receive a, a new body, a, a, a glorified body, and you are going to be, for the first time, standing in the, the presence of Jesus himself. You're not going to have to think about worshiping. It's going to come natural. I want to give you a preview of heaven today. Heaven will be a restoration of what was lost in the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. As a child, I always loved it when Sister Prescott would talk about the Garden of Eden because I just thought it was cool. Acts 3, 19-21 says, Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times, watch this, of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of what? Restoration of all things, of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Revelation 21, verse 5 says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. There will be no need in heaven for a tree of good and evil. I'm going to say this to you, and it's going to be hard for some of you to comprehend. Some of us in here have not seen what others have seen in their life. But imagine a place where there's no evil, no temptation, no cursings, no searching for something wholesome to watch on TV with your kids, no evil. The concept of evil is lost in heaven. Revelations 22, 1 through 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as a crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street on, on, and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No more war. No more fighting. No more Republicans, no more Democrats, no more conservatives, no more liberals. Just peace. Number two, heaven is a place where all people of God who ever lived will dwell. I read a story of a Sunday school teacher who was trying to teach his Sunday school class a lesson about getting to heaven and, and he asked him the question he said so if I come to church every Sunday every Wednesday night and I, I clap and I worship um, I'll get to heaven right and the kid said no he said so if I come to church every time the doors open and I worship and I pay my tithes and I love my pastor I'll go to heaven right the kid said no he said if I do all those things I just mentioned and and uh, and uh, I, I give everything I have to the poor and, and, uh, and, and study to be a preacher myself, and I love my wife and my kids, I'll go to heaven, right? Kids said, no. Sunday school teacher started thinking, man, they know more about the Word than I thought they did. He said, what must I do to go to heaven? And 
Little Johnny over in the corner raised his hand and he pointed to him and he said, you got to die. <laughs> one thing is for certain, no one born again in Jesus will be left out, shut out, or absent. Anybody ever been left out of something? You'll never have to experience that. I was sharing in the first service, I, I'm not a big fan of amusement parks only because I don't like standing in lines. I believe that there will be a line to get into heaven for every single person, just one person in each line. Millions of lines, and everybody steps in at the same time. No lines, no waiting. The gates of heaven will not close until every single saint of God has stepped in. They'll be waiting until we all get there. If you're a documented resident of heaven, you've made it in. Well, Pastor, what does that mean to be documented? The Word says that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you have believed in Jesus' name, if you've repented and you've been justified by his blood, you have been adopted into the family of God, and I don't care who you are or what you've done, most of us know when we go home to wherever home is, the people that love us, even though they want to slap us around sometimes, they'll always open the door. That's what heaven's going to be like. The number of those in heaven cannot be counted. Every single person from the beginning of time until the end of time who has ever acknowledged Christ, believed in him, and meant it, will be there. Think about that. Some of us are going to be surprised who's there. Revelations 5, 9 says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll, and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Nobody's going to be left out. If you've laid claim to your inheritance, you're going to be there. Number three, this should go without saying, but I think many of us can't even comprehend what this next one means. It will be a holy place. We don't we don't value and we don't recognize holiness anymore like we, like we should. Nothing unclean will ever enter the gates of heaven. Not even a thought. Pastor, I can't control. He, you're going to get a glorified mind, heart, body, you're not even going to have to fight your thoughts anymore. Man, that's enough to make me want to shout right there. No detestable thought or person who could think that thought will enter heaven. Holiness does not consist in mystic speculations, enthusiastic ideas, or uncommanded cold traditions. Holiness consists in thinking the way God thinks, willing the way God wills. The closer you get to him, the holier you're going to be. I was watching a Facebook video this morning, and it just caught my attention because he started with the line that I'm getting ready to say. He said uh, he had a, a guy, a, a new person that just came to Christ, accepted Christ as Savior, and I'm fixing to call some of our holy rollers to fall out of their seat. He said... He asked the pastor, he said, Pastor, he said, now that I know Jesus and I've accepted him into my heart, do I have to sm stop smoking dope? The pastor said, no. You don't have to stop smoking dope. That's not how it works. But the closer you get to him, he will show you what he agrees with and what he don't agree with. If you build a wall around that thing and you don't give him access to it, then you can't come in here and say, well, God's okay with it. Whatever it is. I'm not just picking on that one thing. That's just what the video shows. Some of you probably saw it. 
I'll answer that question the way I ask, answer a lot of questions. You're asking the wrong person the wrong question. Make me holy, Lord. Show me who I need to be in you. Show me the things that are detestable to you, Lord. I don't want to do anything that you wouldn't have me to do. Heaven will be holy because we will be completely holy and in tune with God. Revelation 21, 27 says, But there shall by no means enter into heaven, enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The most holy God resides there. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13 says, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Leviticus 11, 44 through 45 says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy. So if you ever question why pastor talks about righteousness and holiness, there you go. He says, For you yourselves, you shall be holy. Why? For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. That sums everything up right there. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Well, Pastor, that's Old Testament. I'm so glad you said that. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Peter is direct quoting Leviticus. Why is that important? Because you need to practice here to be ready for what you're going to encounter in glory. Number four, heaven will be a place where all residents have been glorified, without exception. You hear me quote several different scriptures here all the time. Romans 8.28 is one of them. You all know it by heart yet? For all things work together to good, those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. But let's, let's read the rest of it. Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. All things. Now, some of you are going, Oh, I don't, I don't, that's a tough one. All things. If you are a believer... All things work to good. Now, I've lived in some things as a believer that I did not think was good at the time. I had to have brothers and sisters come around me and encourage me. Hang in there, brother. It's going to be okay. We're praying for you. You just keep being faithful. You keep being faithful. Keep praying. God's with you. You're just in a season right now, but that season's going to pass. I can look back now and say all things. But let's read the rest of it. Verse 29. For whom he, capital H, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Who is supposed to be conformed to the image of Jesus? We are. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, verse 30, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. I want my glorified body. I'm tired of my knees hurting. There's some confusion and some arguments about this. All I can give you is my opinion. I know that after Jesus was resurrected and ascended to heaven and then came back and appeared to the disciples, they didn't believe it was him. What did he do to prove that? He showed them the scars in his hands and his feet and his side. I believe, based on what I've read, that the only person in heaven who will have scars will be Jesus. That's part of our testimony. When we see him in full illumination, we're still going still to see his scars to remind us why we're there in the first place. And we'll worship him. But the Bible tells me that I'm going to receive a glorified body. That means... 
All these scars and broke downness that I've got, amen, it's going to be gone. 1 John 3, 1 through 2, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. See, some of y'all are trying to get your, your worldly friends to understand you, and it's, you're banging your head against the wall. They're not meant to understand you. In fact, there's a scripture in Corinthians that says the, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who don't believe. Just, you can just keep walking. Keep, keep demonstrating. I'm going to say this, not in my notes. Some of you have got some lost friends and some friends who don't know Jesus, who think what you're doing in here every Sunday and Wednesday and Thursday is foolishness. You may be cl too close for them, to, for them to see. Sometimes you've got to back away from something to get a better look at it. Well, in that case, you might be the one that needs to back away a little bit. Pray for them. Love them. But you can hold their hand until rapture comes. If they don't accept him, you're going to have to let go of that hand eventually, or you might get drugged down with them. That one was free. It says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, I'm going to add some words here because it gets kind of confusing, for this corruptible body must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, hell, where is your victory? There ain't going to be no more crying and worrying about death and, and what's, what's coming after. That won't even be in your mind. Come next week, we're going to talk about hell. Different story. Number five, I added this one in for my own sake. If it's you, you can say amen. If you don't think so, you can sit back and not say. You can say, oh, me. I did a little bit of reading. Couldn't really find a scripture to support what I'm getting ready to say, but I still believe it has to be true. There ain't going to be no bills in heaven. I can't imagine being in heaven and have to pay bills. I was talking to the sister over here. We were talking about, will we have jobs in heaven? I do believe we'll be serving and working and, and, and worshiping and praising and doing things because we know that someday we're going to come back with Jesus and reclaim his creation. The Bible says that. So I believe that we will be training and working and doing, but, but it's not going to be like the jobs that we've worked. Amen? Matthew 19, 21 gives us kind of a snapshot of what, what it looks like, finances from the heaven perspective. It says, Jesus said to him, this is Jesus talking, if you want to be perfect, go, he's talking about on earth, sell what you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come, follow me. The rest of the story says the young man dropped his head and walked away because he was very wealthy. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to go out and be homeless and sell everything you own. What this is meant to do is give you an image of the finances of heaven. There ain't going to be no bills in heaven. I wish a credit card bill would come to heaven where I'm at. Number six. Y'all are too tough this morning. See what this one does for you. Heaven will be a place completely void of sadness. 
no sadness, no worrying about loved ones or worrying over bills or worrying if you're doing a good job as a mama or a daddy, worrying if you've messed your friends up or messed you, your kids up or messed yourself up. No anxiety, no worry, no sadness. Revelation 21.4 says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. I've cried a lot of tears on this side of heaven. I don't know about you. There will be no need in heaven for pastoral care. One of the most difficult things for a pastor to do, and I'm not complaining, this is what we're called to do, is to come to the home of a family that's lost a loved one and try to find the right thing to say. Sometimes, most of the time, the right thing to say is nothing. You just sit there and pray. Or go into the hospital. One of the saddest things I've done as a pastor here, I think it was last year, maybe year before last, when we lost Brother Don to COVID. Myself and Dave Bartlemé, and I don't know if there's anybody else. I think it was just me and Dave. He didn't have any family here. He was completely alone, faithful. He sat right back there in that back corner every single Sunday he was here. His family paid for this pulpit. History in this church. I sat by his bed in his last moments and just sang hymns to him. He didn't he probably didn't even know I was there. Such sadness. That changed me. Broke me. Dave came in shortly after I did and he left and then he passed just a few hours, a couple hours later. There won't be any of that in heaven. God will wipe away every tear. Number seven. I left one thing out about the sadness. There's not going to be any backstabbers and gospers in heaven. Everybody that's there is going to love you. You're going to be a sister or a brother from other mothers. Number seven, this is the one that's probably going to scare some of you. It will be a place of continuous worship. Now, I love worship. The closest thing that I can get to heaven, this side of heaven, is when I worship. And when I hear you worship and see you worship, I just have these fantasies of, of, of man, this is just, it's got to be what it's going to kind of be like. Just worship it. Except for I see people in these altars. I was down here with, with Randy and Frankie, and I know these men. I, I spent time with them. I know their stories. I know their history, their heartache, and I know their heart, where they're at. They're, they're children of God. But I watch them worship, and, and I remember, you know, some of the stories that I've heard from them, and it's just, man, look at them worship. I believe that's what the angels are going to be doing. I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. The Bible says we're made lesser than the angels. But I believe one of the things that, that's going to put them in complete awe is when they see us show up to worship. And I'll get to that here in just a minute. Revelation 4, verse 8 says, the four, earlier I read a scripture that says, and they sang a new song. That's us. We're going to be singing a new song with them. But this is Revelation 4, 8. It says, the four living creatures... Each having six wings were full of eyes around and within, and they did not rest day or night for all eternity, every day, every night, as long as this world's been spinning. They've been doing one thing, circling the throne, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, 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 Lord God. That's all they do. Constantly creating this sound and, and this atmosphere of just praise and worship because God has to exist in the center of that. But we're going to come and it's going to change. That song will change. The one difference between Isaiah seeing heaven and as he reported on heaven and us seeing heaven different from how John saw heaven 
is they were in a dream. They were in a vision. So what did, what did John do when he first got to heaven in his vision, his dream in the Revelation, and he saw it? You remember what he did? It says he fell to his face as if he were dead. Why did he do that? It's because as a man not yet in heaven, he had the memory of who he is, his unworthiness. He'll never feel that in heaven. You'll never feel unworthy. He's made you worthy. I can't even compare. There, there's no... It's like going to... I don't know, man. I, I, the only comparison I can think of is a sinful one, but go, going to a, a concert or to a club where you've been stamped. I not got my stamp. But heaven's going to be so much more than that. Your stamp will be his blood. You are worthy to enter in. Enter in. Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost. But we will just be in an overwhelming state of gratitude and praise. Man was created able to sin. We know that because they sinned. After the fall... Man was unable not to sin. It's, we're incapable of that. It's our flesh. After regeneration and salvation, man was made able not to sin. That's his grace. You living your life and just resolving to be sinful because God's got grace on you is nonsense. That's the, 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 the yearning and the striving for holiness is your call in this world, whatever that looks like. After glorification, in heaven, man will be unable to sin. Praise the Lord. No more of me driving around the roundabout and gripping the steering wheel so I help me. I don't want to... Go! That's sinful. Self-control won't even be a need in heaven. We're going to be centrally focused on one thing, the glory of Jesus. Nothing else will even come to mind. That's why when we come in here and, and these praise and worship leaders get up here and they begin to worship, they're trying to invite you into a place where even if just a few minutes, you can just put all the nonsense behind you and just get in his presence even if it's just for a few minutes. John Oatman, a famous writer, wrote the following. He said, Holy, holy, holy is what the angels sing. And I expect to help them make the courts of heaven ring. Watch this. But when I sing redemption story, the angels will fold their wings because angels never felt the joys that my salvation brings. Angels don't need salvation. I believe that when we show up, when I show up and I begin to worship, those angels are going to be over the side, they're going to be looking at me, and they're going to be recognizing, hey, isn't that the guy that lived through all this and did that and fell and, and messed up and just almost destroyed his family and, and, and did all these things? And, and isn't that him? I ain't never worshiped like that, Joe, have you? They're, it's not, they're not going to be able to fathom the worship coming out of these imperfect. The Bible says we are created lesser than the angels. I believe the angels are going to be stunned when they see our worship. We worship God in spite of ourselves. They worship God because of themselves. That's what they were created to do. Why would you expect them to do anything different? We worship in spite of who we are. Oh, man, that's powerful. Number eight. I love this. Some of you in this room know of darkness that I can't even speak of. But everything about this next point just makes me excited. It says, it will be a place of continuous light, void of darkness. The light of Jesus will be everything and everywhere. 
I believe Alaskans are already conditioned for heaven. It's going to be daylight all the time there. Heaven simply would not be heaven without Jesus in it. The light of heaven is the face of Jesus. The joy of heaven is the presence of Jesus. The melody that we sing of heaven is the name of Jesus. The harmony in our voices as we sing about heaven is the praise of Jesus. The theme of heaven is the work of Jesus. The employment of heaven... There you go, sister. The employment of heaven is the service to Jesus, and the fullness of heaven is Jesus. It's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Revelations 21, 23, the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is the light. Heaven is the opposite of evil, the opposite of darkness. Jesus said that men... Love darkness rather than light. Listen to John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. That's Jesus. And by the way, that's us if we're saved. We are to be the light. Do I have to sing the song for you? Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. It's you. Stop laughing at me. Or I'm going to make y'all come up here singing to me next time. <laughs> and this is a combination. The light has come into the world, and men, watch this, and we love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil, do I need to define that for you? That means on a daily basis, you get up and in your heart is darkness, and you're gonna, you know already, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be bad today. I'm gonna. Some of you get up and you go, I'm gonna be bad today. I'm gonna be like the devil. But Lord, the grace of Jesus covers me. You're lying to yourself because you're premeditating your sin. That's not how grace works. Grace covers you on your pursuit of holiness, not your pursuit of sin. If you're pursuing sin, you're in darkness. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. Can you imagine? And does not come to the light. Why? Lest his deeds should be exposed. This is what I've been talking about with the makeup mirror analogy. You know, they don't come to the light because the light exposes them. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. That's why you stay close to Jesus. Not so you can walk around convicted and feeling miserable so that you can see the blemishes and fix them. Let him have access to them. Amen? 1 John 1, 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. No darkness in heaven. Acts 26, 13, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. Revelation 21, 23, I just read this a while ago, the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. Got two more real quick. Number nine. This goes without saying, but we can't even comprehend eternity, the concept of forever. How many of you know what that first day of vacation feels like? Awesome. I love vacation, but if you're like me, in the back of your mind, what, what are you thinking on the first day? i got five days left. And on the... Fourth day, you're thinking, I've got four days left. And the third day, i got three days left. That's a concept that will be erased in eternity. There, there'll be no end. You can worship all day and be in His glory, and I just believe if you want to go take a nap, naps are going to be in heaven. My wife said so. 
You don't have to worry about missing anything because you're going to wake up and it's going to be a new day in eternity. I heard a guy, a, a person explain one time that if you took every grain of sand from every, bre every beach and all over the ocean floor and counted them, that would be one second in eternity. Whew. Pure bliss forever. No bad news. No, the wrong president got elected. Nothing. None of that nonsense. No need to make anything great again because it's going to be the greatest it's ever going to be for eternity. Heaven will be a place of forever. It will never get old. It will never get dull. Endless and eternal joy. I need that in my life. I need joy. Final one. It will be home. For some of you, that's powerful. I moved around a lot as a kid. I've moved around a lot as an adult. My career has moved me. I went to many different schools, never really had roots in any one town. Home sometimes is a foreign concept for me. When we talk about home... I, I'm not a homesick kind of person. And, and my family, if they're watching, they'll tell you that I come home and after about five days, they can tell I'm ready to come back where, I'm, where I came from, here. This wasn't home until I got here. Now it's home. But your citizenship, listen to me, lost person and saved person alike, you were created to be a citizen of heaven. You choose to denounce that citizenship by the way that you live and what you do. Philippians 3.20 For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm reminded of a story that I read. It's an older story about a little boy probably six, seven, eight years old, who I believe he was an orphan and he was dying of cancer. The doctor was sitting with him bedside in this volunteer hospital and the little boy knew Jesus. He loved Jesus. He talked about Jesus. He always wanted to draw pictures of the cross and heaven and in his last moments, he didn't know, it was, I don't think it was his last moments, but in his last moments here on this earth, he grabbed the doctor's hand. And he said, tell me something about heaven. The doctor was a saved man. He loved the Lord. And I can tell you that is a question that you don't want to be asked in that situation. The doctor held his hand and he was trying to think of something to say to the little boy on his level that he could understand. And about that time, the doctor, when he would come to the hospital, he would bring his Labrador retriever with him. The door was shut, but he could hear the Labrador clawing at the door, wanting in. He looked at the little boy and he said, You love Jesus, right? Yes. With all my heart, I love him. He said, that's my dog clawing at that door. He has no idea what's on this side of the door. And he doesn't care. All he knows is his master. Is it here? He said, son, imagine... That's what heaven's like. It don't even matter. All you need to know is Jesus is there. He loves you. He died for you. Make up whatever illustration, fantasy, dream that you can think of. But what you need to be asking yourself today is do I love him so much that it don't matter what heaven's like as long as he's there. 
Beth and I have had a lot of conversations lately. We've talked about it a lot over the years, about home. Stand to your feet, if you will. We have, end of this month, we'll be here for, be married for 27 years. We've moved a lot. My job has moved us a lot over the years. Now my ministry has moved us. We've had conversations about home. We've moved so many times with our job and our kids going to different schools. Sometimes when we think about home, it, it's, it's almost not a, not a relevant thought anymore. This is home for us. This is where God's got us. But my prayer for you today is that something that I have said, if you know Jesus, you have a reason to just give him a moment of praise and worship him in your way, whether it be down here or back there. So that's my first invitation. Thank God that you've made that your home. The other side of that coin is you've heard this today and it's made you a little homesick. You're not sure that that's your home. You've done what needs to be done to get there. Don't worry about the rules and, and what you've heard some person tell you. Listen. Listen to me. If you know who Jesus is, if you acknowledge who he is and what he did for you, if you're wondering what these people are doing, they're waiting on you. This is the new thing. Get used to it. Nobody will ever come to this altar and be alone again. If you acknowledge who Jesus is and from your heart ask him to forgive you of your sins, repent. You just say, Lord, Jesus, I believe that you are who the word says you are. I repent and I ask you to forgive me today and I promise you I'll do the best I can to follow you and work with you and let you use me as a vessel here on earth. Those are the three things. If you are not certain that your home is heaven today, please come today. I'm preaching on hell next week, but don't wait until next week. I have an altar for you to come. You want to come. There's a song as you're contemplating. There's a song that Beth's mother used to sing when we were kids. I'm going to try to get her to sing it when she comes up in July. It's an older song. But I love the chorus in this song. It just paints a picture for me. It says, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. But the angels are beckoning me from heaven's open door. Lord, I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I love you. And I love my family. I love my life. But I am ready to go home. I'm tired of this world and the nonsense. I'm here. I love the Lord. I'm faithful to serve for as long as I need to do that. And I'm going to do that. But I tell him every time I talk to him, Lord, if it be your will, take me home. Take us all home. I'll be faithful. You keep putting people in front of me, and I'll keep preaching the truth and leading them to you. But, Lord, I'm letting you know that I don't hold on to anything here. I'm looking forward to being with you in glory. That's where my hope is. You have the same hope this morning, or you can have. I'm going to pray. If you want to come, come. The moment that you get here, people will be praying with you. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, Jesus, we just thank you for this word. Father, I thank you so much for the few scriptures that you've given us that outline and create a picture of what our heavenly home is going to be like. I thank you for preparing that place for me. Lord, when this world gets to be too much, 
and I'm feeling down and depressed, Lord, I just pray that you would remind me that this is not my home. I am just passing through. Father, right now I pray over every person here today. There is absolutely, Lord, no excuse whatsoever for someone who does not know you and has not locked in their real estate in heaven not to be in this altar praying through you today. So right now, I pray, Lord, that you will pull on their hearts, bring them to this altar. They don't need to check off a list and, and cover a bunch of check boxes before coming to you. They just need to come to you, surrender, submit, and you will take care of the checked off boxes. But Lord, if they choose not to come, I'm begging you, Father, for grace. Give them the time that they need to get over themselves. Stop being prideful and stubborn. Stop holding on to a world that's going to go away one day. Give them time to make up their mind about you. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. And I don't lay out next week because I'm talking about hell. <laughs>